All right, all. Welcome to our week 11 video PowerPoint lecture. In this video PowerPoint lecture, we are into chapter 11, which is entitled The Introduction to Organic Chemistry. And there's two parts to this video lecture. So this is going to be part one of our video lecture. So let's begin. In this chapter, we're studying organic compounds. So the first question we have to deal with is, well, what are we studying when we're studying organic compounds? What is an organic compound? An organic compound is a compound that's made from one or more carbon atoms. In addition, to having one or more carbon atoms, organic compounds have got many hydrogen atoms. And in addition to the one or more carbons, the many hydrogens, you may also see oxygen, sulfurs, nitrogens, and halogens in organic compounds. Typical organic compounds have covalent bonds, they have low melting points. They have low boiling points. They're flammable. They're soluble in nonpolar solvents. And they're not soluble in water. So these characteristics tell us an awful lot about what's going on in an organic compound. Take for instance low melting points, low boiling points. Remember with the ionic compounds they had high melting points, high boiling points, right? Because of the type of bond, the very strong ionic bond. Covalent bonds, remember, not quite the same. So consequently, we don't see high melting points and boiling points. Coming down here to their solubility, remember that like dissolves like. Okay? So nonpolar solvents, nonpolar bonds, right? No dipole moments. So since they are soluble in nonpolar solvents, that's telling us that for the most part, organic compounds themselves are nonpolar in nature. And as a result, they're not going to dissolve in the polar solvent water. So already in that last slide with the characteristics of organic compounds, we're seeing that organic compounds are quite different from the inorganic compounds that we have been studying. So this particular slide, let's just compare and contrast because some of the problems that you have at the back of your chapter, uh, they'll give you properties of compounds and they'll ask you to say whether it's inorganic or organic. So. Let's look at the property of bonding, polarity of bonds, melting point, boiling point, flammability, and solubility in water. And let's compare and contrast so that you can put a, a compound into the correct category. So organic compounds we just saw, bonding, mostly covalent, polarity of the bonds, nonpolar for the most part if there's just carbon and hydrogen. But remember, we could see oxygen, sulfurs, nitrogens, halogens. So if you have any of those present, um, you're going to have some polar bonds. All right, for the most part, melting points, unusually low. Boiling points, unusually low. Very flammable. And solubility, in water because they are nonpolar in nature. They're not soluble. Some exceptions though, if we see a polar group present, right? so if we have an oxygen, a nitrogen, a sulfur, 
or a halogen, we're going to see that the solubility in water is going to change. Okay. So the inorganic compounds. Let's compare and contrast. We've already seen inorganic compounds. Many of them have ionic bonds. And some of them have covalent, particularly those ionic compounds that have the polyatomics in them. Polarity of the bonds. Most of them are ionic or polar covalent. And very few are nonpolar covalent. So consequently, since you have ionic bonds, you have the unusually high melting points and boiling points that we're used to seeing because of the strength of those ionic bonds. They are incredibly tough to break and take a lot of energy, high melting points, high boiling points. In terms of flammability, low. Solubility in water, like dissolves like. So most of them are soluble unless they have um, a nonpolar part, a huge nonpolar part in them. Okay. All right. So carbon is at the heart of organic compounds, right? So let's just do a little bit of review in regards to our carbon. In organic compounds, find a lot of carbon and a lot of hydrogens. So thinking about where carbon is in the periodic table, group four, carbon has four valence electrons. And this would be its Lewis dot structure. Hydrogen, on the other hand, right, has only one. So let's refresh our memory. Valence electrons, right? What's everything going for? That noble gas configuration. So hydrogen, which is one, its closest noble gas is helium. It wants two. And our carbon, okay, it's got four. It wants eight. So um, that's going to give it a noble gas configuration. To achieve an octet, carbon needs to have four more bonds. So how does it do so with hydrogen? There it goes, all right? They share electrons in a covalent bond. This would be our Lewis dot structure for a one carbon, the simplest organic compound. One carbon, four hydrogens. And remember that oftentimes we take those dots and we replace them with um, straight um, horizontal and vertical lines. Okay. Well, it turns out when carbon forms four bonds, four covalent bonds, it takes on a tetrahedral shape. Carbon atom with four single covalent bonds. Doesn't matter what they're to. They could just be to hydrogen or they could be to other carbons. All right. But it takes on this thing called a tetrahedral shape. What's a tetrahedral shape? Here is a tetrahedral shape. Okay. Here's a model. Um, if carbon in the center and there would be a hydrogen here, 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 and here. Okay. Where my thumb is. Okay. I think thumb and finger. Um, so tetrahedral shape, notice that each of those uh, bonds, those covalent bonds is pointing towards the corner of a regular tetrahedron, right? Tetrahedron means that each of these angles here, 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 all right, here, here, all the angles are 109.5 degrees. Right, so methane, that's the name of this simplest compound. There's our Lewis dot structure, which we can then replace with all the lines. And there is our tetrahedral shape. So um, what do organic chemists do in order to show this tetrahedral shape? They, um, any, any atom that's in the plane of the paper, all right, or the screen here, is just going to be a solid line. All right, 
regular straight line. If it's going behind the plane of the paper, they'll dash it. And if it's coming out at you, coming out of the plane towards you, then they're going to uh, wedge it. All right. So that's the way that chemists uh, show three dimensions in organic chemistry. All right, so what happens when we uh, have more than one carbon atom? Well, in molecules with two or more carbon atoms, each carbon atom with four single bonds is going to have a tetrahedral shape. So let's do two, one, two, and then let's flip it so you could see all of the, um, the bonds. Okay, so each of those carbons has four bonds. And let's just imagine, you know, they're to, they're to hydrogens, okay? Each of them has that same tetrahedral shape. Okay, so this is uh, a two-carbon uh, organic compound. So this would be the next most complicated one. Um, and so here's its Lewis structure. Its name is ethane, and we'll learn how to name them in a little bit, okay? So remember, we can take all of those and, and just put uh, lines, straight lines for the, the two dots, okay? And then there would be the, um, the representation that's showing the shape, okay, that tetrahedral structure. So as a result of the tetrahedral shape, if we now, uh, let's add another one to it, okay? Let's add another couple to it, all right? Okay, first, first let's do one. All right. And what happens, okay, so each, each one that we put on uh, continues to have that, that tetrahedral shape. And notice what's happening. We're getting a zigzag structure, and it becomes even more obvious when we put on another carbon. And I ran out of my gray and black, which is supposed to be carbon. All right. Um, so I got to use a blue one on there. But now you can really see the zigzag shape that's that's happening, okay, as a result of the um, the tetrahedral shape, okay. And what else do we want to point out about it? Each and every carbon-carbon single bond exhibits something that we call free rotation, all right, and they're constantly just moving around like this. Okay, every single one of them is exhibiting this same thing. So if you can imagine them all just turning, all right, very randomly. Okay, it's something to remember as we move on and talk about other compounds. So when you have carbon-carbon single bonds, each of them has this free rotation about the carbon-carbon single bond. All right, okay, brings us to hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, they are a large family of organic compounds. And they're composed of exactly what that name is telling us. All right. What's it say? Hydro, right, and carbons. All right. So they're composed of only carbon and hydrogen. All right. Only carbon and hydrogen. Okay. Well, we can take this very large family of organic compounds, and it's in fact split into two subgroups. Uh, the first one are those that we call saturated hydrocarbons. Saturated hydrocarbons means that each and every carbon, once you attach all the carbons together, each and every carbon has the maximum number of hydrogens attached to them. Um, this particular subset of hydrocarbons, um, we find the alkanes. Alkanes are those organic compounds that have only carbon-carbon single bonds. Our second um, subgroup of hydrocarbons are the unsaturated hydrocarbons unsaturated meaning they don't have the maximum amount of hydrogens that could be attached to each carbon. In this um, group we have the alkenes, the alkynes, and the aromatics. Alkenes are characterized by a carbon-carbon double bond. 
alkynes by, you can see it there, a triple bond, and aromatics and apologies here. Uh, it has a six-membered ring with alternating double and single bonds. We're going to begin our study over at the hydrocarbons um, that are saturated, the alkanes. So, just as we said on the previous slide, alkanes, they're hydrocarbons, and they contain only carbon and hydrogen. What else? Carbon, carbon, single bonds only. So that means that every single carbon in an alkane is going to have four bonds to it. Four single bonds. All they've got is carbon and hydrogen, no polar bonds, so alkanes as a group of compounds are going to be nonpolar. They have the general molecular formula of CnH2n plus 2. So on this slide, I have given you just a whole different variety of organic compounds, alkanes compounds that contain just carbon and hydrogen, and they have just carbon-hydrogen bonds. And you'll note that there's different ways that organic chemists um, depict or draw or represent uh, these alkanes, right? Some of them are showing everything. So here's our Lewis structure, right? Some of them are showing that zigzag shape, right? This one here, you're seeing a zigzag shape, but we're not seeing any of the carbons or hydrogens. They're understood. Okay, here, um, yeah, we're not showing everything. Okay, we're we're taking and you know shrinking it down. We're only showing those bonds between the carbons, not between the carbons and the hydrogens. Here, we've even taken away right um, those bonds between the carbon, right, and they're implied. This one here, we're crunching everything together. All right, we're um, really abbreviating it. And over here we see one of those three dimensional uh, structures, right? Okay, where we've got those that are in the plane of the, the, the screen. We've got that one coming out at us, this one going behind the plane because it's dashed. All right, so uh, organic chemists, one of the things you're going to find as you're reading the textbook, there's a variety of ways that you can represent organic compounds. Um, beginning with the alkanes. Um, so let's begin looking at the ones that you need to be familiar with in this course, all right, the representations that you need to be able to draw. Um, structural formulas. Alkanes are written um, a lot of times with these things called structural formulas, all right? And uh, the structural formulas can be done in two ways. One is the structural formula can be expanded. In an expanded structural formula, what you are doing is you are showing each and every bond, everything. Nothing is left to the imagination. And another way that chemists write structural formulas is to condense them. All right. If because uh, expanded ones take a whole lot of time. You're showing everything. Nothing, as I said, is left to the imagination. So um, time consuming to write out expanded structural formulas. So oftentimes, in the interest of time, organic chemists will condense them, condensed um, structural formulas. So show each carbon atom and its attached hydrogen atoms. And there are several different ways that, that, that we can do those. All right. 
So let's just give you um, one of each as an example. All right. So this is an example of an expanded structural formula. It is showing each and every carbon to carbon bond and each and every carbon to hydrogen bond. This one here, on the other hand, okay, is a condensed structural formula. Okay, condensed structural formula. Um, here it is. All right, what are we doing? We're showing each carbon atom, right? So, and it's attached hydrogens okay but um, you have to then put in and imagine right that each of these hydrogens is bonded to that carbon that carbon's bonded to this carbon etc okay so there is our condensed okay. all right so let's just re redraw them here okay um, here is our expanded structural formula, and here is our condensed. So notice here, I just drew this condensed slightly different because sometimes the condensed structural formula will, in fact, put in this carbon to carbon bond. All right, on the previous slide, I showed you another one where they just took it out altogether. All right. All right, so how do we get from one to the other? It's real important to be able to do that. Okay, so again, that's the expanded, that's the condensed. The condensed formulas, all right, are written from an expanded. So the expanded showing everything, all right? So condensed formulas are written for the expanded formula by showing each carbon atom right each carbon atom and the attached hydrogen atoms so let's just box them in all right so hopefully you can see i boxed in this uh, carbon here at the very end all right the one with three hydrogens on it how does that translate on the other side well there it is okay so we're uh, sort of shrink wrapping it down okay all right, pulling those three hydrogens down next to the carbon. All right, and then there's a bond, as you see, to another carbon. We're showing that. And what do we have next? They're in blue on the left, right? We have a carbon with two hydrogens. So we draw the carbon and we shrink wrap down. We pull down those two hydrogens next door. Okay, we contract them, so to speak. All right, what's next over in our expanded? Another carbon with two hydrogens, okay? And again, let's shrink wrap it down. Let's contract it. There it is, okay, CH2. And then lastly, what do we have over on the left? We have another carbon with three hydrogens. So let's um, bring those down. Let's contract them down. And we have that CH subscript three. Okay, notice that these are all subscripts. All right, so um, when you're writing these, make sure that you write them correctly. Okay, all right. So if you have a lot of these um, CH2s, okay, uh, in between, sandwich between two CH3s, oftentimes what they'll do, you might remember in the earlier slide, is that they took and they wrote a CH2, okay, they did something like this, CH, oh gosh, this, I never knew how hard it is to write with these pointers, okay, but going back to that original slide where I showed you a whole lot of different structures, all right, so what they did was they took and they put them in parentheses, CH2, 2. Um, so this could be a CH3. This would be another way. This would be ultra condensed, okay? And so it's good to see how we would do this CH3. Ah, oh, struggle. The struggle is real here to write with a small, with a mouse. All right, okay, CH, right, there it is, okay? All right, so that would be another type of condensed structure, okay?
moving on. All right, so we have then um, at our disposal, and this is a skill that you have to be able to do in the problems. You have to be able to, to write a molecular formula, an expanded and a condensed formula, and to go uh, run the gamut through all of them. Um, go from molecular to expanded to condensed, go from condensed to expanded to molecular, all right? Um, and everything in between. So let's just review everything here. So we've got four alkanes, right? We've got the molecular formula that we can draw, the structural formula, the expanded, and the condensed. So let's start with uh, let's start with the simplest um, organic compound, that one carbon one. All right, name is methane, and again we'll see how we get that name. All right, molecular formula, you know how to do that. Okay, number of carbons, the number of hydrogens. Okay, structural formula. Structural formula, two types, right? Okay, the expanded, so there's the expanded, and then let's condense it down. So this one's an interesting one because the molecular formula and the condensed are identical. Okay, let's add another carbon to it. Uh, so that would be C2H6. All right, so remember, how do we know it's C2H6, right? CnH2 n plus 2, we said, right? Okay, general formula. So let's expand it. There it is. There's our two carbon expanded. And now let's condense it. And notice it's CH3, CH3. Okay. You could also have taken this out. All right. So propane, three carbons. One hydro or eight hydrogens. Again, CnH2n plus two. That's how we get that formula. And let's expand it all out, showing everything, all three with the maximum amount of hydrogens. And now let's condense it. All right, a couple different ways to do it: CH3, CH2, CH3, or CH3, CH2, and CH3. So in this particular one, what are we doing? We're just showing the uh, the zigzag. All right. Um, either of those is perfectly correct. Again, if you're going to do this one, you could have just as well taken these out and just put them all side by side. OK, so make sure that you can go back and forth between each of them. OK, more on alkanes. Let's continue with our study. So there's two types of alkanes. All right. And again, alkanes are those with just carbon, carbon, single bonds, carbon and hydrogen. We split the alkanes into two separate groups, straight chain alkanes, or what are referred to as normal alkanes. And here are some examples. So our one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon. Notice they're just carbon attached to carbon, attached to carbon, and they're making a long straight chain. OK, that is one type of alkane, the second type are what we call branched chain alkanes. Branched chain alkanes have a, uh, a straight chain, but then coming off of the straight chain, we'll see branches. So you see here one, two, three, four in, in a straight chain. And then what do we have here? We have a branch, okay, like a branch of a tree. Here in this particular one, we see one, two, three carbons in a straight chain, and then off the, off the central one, we see a branch and a branch, okay? So they are uh, quite different, all right? Straight chain, branched chain. Again, think of having a straight chain, a tree trunk of carbons, and then branches like the branches of a tree coming off at different points in a branched chain alkane. Physical properties of alkanes. Well, they're nonpolar, just carbon and hydrogen. Because they're nonpolar, they're going to be insoluble in water. They're going to have a lower density than water. 
lower density than water, that means they're going to float. The alkanes are going to float on water. They've got low boiling and melting points because their intermolecular attractions are one of the weakest kinds. So if you have an alkane with from anywhere from one to four carbons, they tend to be gases at room temperature. As you get from five to 17 carbons, these are your kerosenes, your diesel and your jet fuels, they're liquids. And if we go to 18 or more carbon atoms, they become soft solids. These are your waxes, your paraffin, your Vaseline, soft solids. So we said that the uh, melting and boiling points of alkanes are low, right? But remember, there's two types of alkanes. There's those straight chains, and then there's those branched ones, right? In terms of the melting and boiling points, right, they can't always be the same, all be at the same point. So as the number of carbons goes up and increases, we find that the melting and boiling point also goes up, right? As the number of branches goes up, we find that the melting and boiling points go down. So with this information, you're able to do problems like this. Here are two different organic compounds. Who's going to have the higher melting point and boiling point? So you take them and you look at them and say, well, this one here, this is a condensed structure. Let's expand it out and we have a straight chain alkane. This one here, on the other hand, okay, I still, let's, nope, this one's a branched, okay. So, whoops, there it is. Left that out. We need another another carbon on there. So this one is a branched chain alkane. So based upon that, straight chain with four carbons, branched with four carbons, who's going to have the higher melting point, boiling point, right? Well, as the number of branches go up, so we've got a branch here, none there. Uh, this one's going to have the lower melting point and boiling point. Okay. All right, we're ready to learn how to name our, um, our organic compounds, our alkanes, nomenclature. So what do we use? We use what is known as the IUPAC, I-U-P-A-C method of nomenclature, okay? So the way it's pronounced is IUPAC, uh, and it's short for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, who developed this naming system uh, back during World War II, all right? So um, this has been in use since that point in time. All right, with this IUPAC method of nomenclature, the name of every single organic molecule using this IUPAC uh, method has three parts to it. The first part is the parent. The parent name uh, indicates to you the number of carbons in the longest continuous carbon chain. The second part is the suffix. Suffix, the end, right, the end of it, that indicates what family or functional group is present. And the third part is a prefix. The prefix tells you the identity, location, and number of branches or substituents that are attached to your longest continuous carbon chain to your parent. So there are the three parts, right, and what each of them are going to tell you, the parent. That's the first thing, okay, parent. What is the longest carbon chain? And it has to be continuous. It can go around corners, 
right? Suffix, what functional group? Do we have a carbon-carbon single bonds? Do we have double bonds, triple bonds? Um, do we have other things in there, okay? And then the prefix, do we have branches? Do we have substituents? Do we have uh, carbon branches? Do we have an oxygen, right, um, et cetera? Where are they? All right, so there it is, that IUPAC system, three parts to the name. So we're color coding them here, prefix, parent, suffix. Again, the parent, how many carbons? That's how we get that. We, we ask ourselves, how many carbons? And your prefix, where are your substituents? What are your substituents? And that suffix, what family, what functional group, as we say. All right. What do we need? Well, that first part, that parent. Um, in order to get the parent, we need to have some information. All right. Parent alkanes. If you uh, re recall, all right, as we're going to go through this table and, and make a table here of parent alkanes. Um, alkanes have that general formula CNH2N plus 2. Okay, so um, as we look at these condensed structures, you can come up with a molecular formula for each. All right, so we begin with a one carbon um, alkane. One carbon alkane, right? One carbon four hydrogens. We call this methane. All right, so the A-N-E, that suffix ending, is telling you, notice that you have an alkane, so just carbons and hydrogens. The meth part is telling you how many carbons in that alkane, just one. Let's build it. Let's put two together, all right? Two carbons just carbons and hydrogens, it's an alkane. Two carbons is represented with the prefix eth, ethane, okay? Three, again, it's just carbons and hydrogens, so they're alkanes. And how do we indicate three? With the prefix prop, right? So notice there's nothing else other than a parent and a suffix in all of these alkane names um, because they're all straight chains, okay? Straight chain alkanes. There's no prefix. There's no branches, all right? So this is where we're going to get a lot of our information from, these names for alkanes for carbon. Notice the convention that we're doing here. We're using those parentheses, all right? So four is but, but, and then a and E tells us we have an alkane, just carbons and hydrogens, carbon-carbon single bonds, 5-pentane. Again, notice the convention we're using. We're not writing them all out. So we do CH3 or CH2, three of them. That means there's three of them in a row. Okay, hexane for 6, heptane for 7, octane for eight, no name for nine of them, decane for ten, undecane for eleven, and dodecane for twelve. So you need to know these twelve alkane names and their prefixes. So let's see how we're going to use that information to name other alkanes now. All right, so we're going to take those names for the normal straight chain alkanes, and we're going to use those to build names for um, any other type of alkane that we might encounter with substituents on it. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to count the number of carbons in the longest continuous carbon chain. Oh, there's the issue again. Longest continuous carbon chain. 
All right. Keep in mind that that longest continuous carbon chain could go around corners. Okay. So um, it, it's not always straight. All right. So sometimes wrap around, wrap up, wrap down. Okay. Around corners. That's how you're going to find this parent name. Now, some textbooks call it a base name. All right. Since we're dealing with alkanes, right, it's going to end in A and E. All right, so let's do an example here. Okay, so here is a carbon chain. We need to count and find the longest continuous carbon chain. So you're going to go from both ends one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Could it have been this one? One, two, three, four, five. No, we got a longer one going this way. One, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the longest continuous one, and you could have numbered from the other direction too. I just typically, you know, if I have the same on both sides, I go from, um, from left to right as is customary okay all right so the longest continuous carbon chain is seven all right that's hept all right and what else do we see well they're all carbon carbon single bonds so the parent is a heptane all right that's all we've done here is we have come up with the parent or the base name all right secondly Every single branch that's coming off that parent chain, the longest continuous carbon chain, is considered a substituent. So we do see right here, right, we see a substituent. Okay, so um, we've got to name that. Okay, so if you do have a substituent, which we do have, you have to identify the name of each substituent, All right? And a substituent is a, a carbon substituent. is simply an alkane, one of our alkanes that we had, less one hydrogen atom. And it's called an alkyl group. So remember, we had the alkane CH4, right? That is methane. What we saw in that molecule on the previous slide was a CH3 group. So it's an alkane, it's methane, minus right, a hydrogen atom. And so this is called an alkyl group. It is known as a methyl group. Okay. And so we could have the methyl group. We could have ethyl. We could have propyl, butyl, right? We could have isopropyl, isobutyl, secbutyl, tert-butyl, some of the more common alkyl substituents. Okay, you should minimally know um, methyl, ethyl, propyl, and butyl. Okay, these are a little bit more complex. Okay, if you know them all, the better. But these minimally are the ones that you need to know. Okay. So now what do we do? All right, we've identified that we have a substituent and it's a methyl group. Okay, we're going to number the carbons in that parent chain now. We're going to number them again. First time it was for counting. This time we're going to number them so that the positions of the substituents have the lowest possible numbers. Okay, all right, so here's a slightly different one. Okay. So let's let's go through and, and name it, okay, using our, our previous rules, right? So parent for this one, longest continuous carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? So it's five no matter what way you look at it, it's five. So parent would be pentane. And then we have a substituent, okay? There's our substituent right here, okay? It's a methyl group. So we right. need to number that carbon chain now. So to give that methyl group the lowest possible number, so we number one, two, 
this way it gives us a 2 if we numbered the other way it would have a higher number okay so that would be the appropriate numbering way not this direction because this direction gives that substituent a number 4 so this one is incorrect okay all right let's continue with our rules all right so we've got our parent chain we've named our substituent and we've given that substituent a position number you're now going to assign a name based upon the following format you're going to start out with a substituent position number then the substituent name and then the parent name all as one word okay if there's more than one substituent you need to list them in alphabetical order and if there's multiples of a particular substituent you're going to use the prefixes di tri and tetra but when you are doing your alphabetizing you don't use the di tri or the tetra okay let's do an example where we pull everything in all right here we go you ready okay all of the rules right prefix parent suffix okay first thing we need is the parent okay parent as we're going through here we find that we have eight one two three four five six seven eight okay they're all carbon carbon single bonds so this is an octane okay we have two substituents we have a methyl we have an ethyl okay so we're going to alphabetize them the ethyl is going to go first the methyl second in our name but we have to give them a position number okay all right well we number from this side it's one two three we number from this side it's one two three right one two three four five six seven eight all right and this is one two three four five six so it's three and six what do we do well we're alphabetizing so we're going to come in this direction it's going to be one two three four five six seven and eight okay if they're both in the same position we're going to alphabetize it so it's three dash ethyl dash six dash methyl octane all right well what if you have any of those other substituents remember we said sometimes organic compounds have oxygens nitrogens um sulfurs and even halogens in them uh, if they have those we still use the same rules for substituents okay so here are some other uh, groups that you might have all right you might see an NH2 group that's an amino uh, if there's a uh, fluorine it's fluoro chlorine chloro bromo uh, for bromine if it's an iodine it's iodo and NO2 is a nitro group okay so if you have any of those on there it's the same rules okay same rules as before so for instance let's take this particular compound here okay so we have a bromo and we have a nitro group on it all right so it's one two three four all right as opposed to one two three four why because we're going to alphabetize bromine first nitro second and our name is two dash bromo dash three dash nitro butane again notice how we run that all together okay uh, let's do another one okay again to show you so the same thing a bromo and a nitro 
and uh, we're going to number to give them the lowest possible numbers. So one, two, three, four, and we have one bromo, one dash bromo, dash three, dash nitrobutane, again, running it all together as one word. Okay, let's do a couple examples and then um, we'll cut this short. What is the IUPAC name for the following compound? Okay. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We find that the longest continuous uh, carbon chain is eight. Okay. And it doesn't matter which way we go, we still have eight. Okay. So we number to give it the lowest possible numbers. We're going to alphabetize. Ooh, we're going to alphabetize. What did I do wrong here, folks? Um, that ethyl needs to come out front. Okay. So the four ethyl, that's how, where we start it. Okay. Four ethyl out here. Two dash methyl octane. Okay. What's the structure? Now you should be able to go back and forth. It's much easier to take this, the name and, and draw it. All right. So what are you going to do? We're going to look here at the parent hexane and you're going to put six carbons. And then on two and four, you're going to put methyl groups. Okay. So six carbons in a row. All right. The parent. And then that's telling us on the two and the four, dimethyl means you have a methyl on each of them. Okay, and again, when you're drawing this structure, you're making sure that each carbon has four bonds to it. Okay, four single bonds. Okay. All right, alkene reactions. Well, it turns out that with those carbon carbon single bonds, uh, alkanes are not very reactive, and they literally have one reaction that you need to be responsible for um, combustion. What's combustion? Well, every single alkene is going to burn in the presence of oxygen. So you take your alkane, right, and you add to it oxygen, O2. Remember, it's diatomic, okay? And when an organic compound, any of them, an alkane, burns in the presence of oxygen, it creates carbon dioxide and water. So you should be able to uh, balance a combustion reaction for any alkane. Remember how to balance. You have to have the same number of molecules uh, or, or same number of atoms of every single element on the left side and on the right side. Okay, so there's plenty of those to practice in the textbook. All right. All right, so in addition to our straight chain normal alkanes and our branched alkanes, we also have what are known as cycloalkanes. Cycloalkanes are alkanes, right? So still just carbon and hydrogen, except the carbon atoms are joined together in rings, right? So in order to have a ring, um, that means that um, the general formula for an, a cycloalkane would be CnH2n. And that N would have to start at the number three in order to have a cyclic structure. All right, so N is three, four, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And how do you name these? Well, they're real, real easy. Okay. We simply uh, look and count up the number of carbons. All right, so there's three here. So that would be a propane, but it's, it's in a cyclic structure. So we call it cyclopropane. So oftentimes um, they take and they really condense these structures, all right, for cycloalkanes. This is a carbon with two hydrogens right there where two lines come together, another carbon with two hydrogens, another carbon with two hydrogens, all right. Four, that would be a butane normally, but it's in a cyclic structure, so it's cyclobutane. Five carbons, that would be a pentane, but it's in a cyclic structure, so it's cyclopentane six carbons okay just carbon hydrogen 
all single bonds, cyclic structure, that's cyclohexane. So these uh, cycloalkanes can have substituents on them, just like our, our normal alkanes, and you name them in the same way. The only difference is that the parent's name has got that cyclo added onto it. Okay, so make sure you practice some of those naming problems. All right, we move on to our second type of hydrocarbon, the unsaturated hydrocarbons. And these, we're going to focus on those that have the double and the triple bonds, the alkenes and the alkynes, all right, not so much the aromatics. All right, so they are hydrocarbons again with double and triple bonds. So if they have a double and triple bond between the carbons, then they're not going to have the maximum number of hydrogens. And that's where they get that name, unsaturated hydrocarbons. The geometry is different when you have a double bond or a triple bond. In the case of the double bond, the geometry about the carbons is trigonal planar. And so here's a model with two carbon atoms. And unfortunately, I don't have a double bond. I said all my models are in the school in my office and I can't get in. All right, so here's a carbon-carbon double bond. That double bond in there, all right, changes things. We no longer have a tetrahedral structure. We have a trigonal planar structure. Okay, so the bond here is 120 degrees. Okay, the bond angle here is 120, and the bond angle here is 120. Same thing on the other side. Okay, the geometry about the carbons in a triple bond is linear. Okay, so here's our carbon carbon triple bond, and what does that do? Well, it makes this guy right here is 180, and this one here is 180. Okay, so linear. Okay, how do we name alkenes and alkynes? Same naming uh, system, the IUPAC. So it has those same parts to it that we talked about. Um, the parent chain, right? Still the longest continuous chain. This time, though, here's the rule. It's got to contain either the double or the triple bond. For alkenes, how are we going to indicate that we have a carbon-carbon double bond? We change that suffix. The parent is going to end in E-N-E -E for the alkene family. All right, notice the ending. All right, remember an alkane was A-N-E, -E, alkene, E-N-E. -E. And for the alkynes, the parent is going to end in Y-N-E for the alkyne family. All right, so you find the longest continuous carbon chain that contains the double or the triple bond and put the appropriate ending onto that. All right, and then you're going to number the parent chain so that that double or the triple bond gets the lowest possible number, and you're going to indicate where it is. Okay, indicate the position of the higher order bond with a number before that base or the parent name. Sample problem. Let's determine the correct names for the following compounds. Here's compound number one. Okay. So the first thing we notice here is that it's not an alkane, right? It is an alkyne, right? And we've got some substituents on it. So first things first, we need to figure out who our parent is. And so we start numbering one, two, three, four, five. Five, right, we're going to go around one, two, three, four, five. Doesn't matter, right? One, two, three, four, four. Doesn't matter what way we go. The longest continuous carbon chain is five, right? So it's a pent, and it's a pent 
ein. Additionally, in addition, right? We've got some substituents. Okay, who are they? CH3s. They are methyl. All right. So we need to number, as it says, to give not these methyl groups, but this group here, right? Our double or our triple bond, the lowest possible number. And so we're going to come from this direction here. This is going to be our one. This is going to be our two, right? Three, four, and here is our number five, right? So this is four. And this guy here is three, right? So we're going to put this name together with everything, right? Everything that we have just seen. So we have four, four, dimethyl, and then dash. Now where's our, where's our triple bond? It's on the two, dash, two, dash, pentine. Okay. Let's do a second one here. Ooh, this one's a tuppy. All right. But it's a good one. All right. So first things first. We're looking to see, is it an alkane, alkene, alkyne? And what do we notice? We notice a double bond. So it's an alkene. So it's going to have that E-N-E -E ending at it, right? And we're going to number the longest continuous carbon chain, uh, including that. So it's going to be one, two, right? Three, four, five. So that's not it. One, two, three, four five, six, seven, All right? So it's seven. And so it's going to be a heptene. We have three different substituents. We have an ethyl here and we have two methyls. Okay, so we've got to number this. One, right? Two, three, Four, five, six, and seven. Okay. All right, seven. And let's put it all together. All right, ready to put it all together? So we have alphabetically, right? Three, ethyl, four, six, dimethyl dash now we have to say where's that where's that double bond it's on the one one heptene all right good job moving on more about our alkenes again let's talk about general formula because from the molecular formula of an organic compound you can tell whether you have an alkene Cane, cycloalkane, or an alkene. C N H two N, where your N can be two, three, four, etc. Right? And an alkene has to have at least one carbon carbon double bond, as we said. You'll see that. Uh, Sometimes you'll see in textbooks that alkenes are referred to as olefins. Here's an example of an alkene. Here's another one. All right. Let's name them. Our very first one is 1-butene. And our second one is 2-butene. So our 1-butene um, is known as a mono-substituted alkene. You just have one substituent. There it is. And our 2-butene is known as a di-substituted alkene. Isomerism in alkenes. 
Alkenes have what we call geometric isomers. That double bond restricts free rotation. Remember we said the alkanes have free rotation about the carbon-carbon single bonds. The double bond restricts it. Can't rotate. I wish I had a model to show you. Um, it would break the double bond. So we end up with a top side and a bottom side. Top face, bottom face. And as a consequence, we end up with isomers. Isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula, but a different arrangement of the atoms. Right? So um, with alkenes, when the substituents end up on the same side, the same face, we call them cis alkenes. And when they end up on opposite sides, we call them trans. So here's an example. This is a di-substituted alkene. So here's our double bond. And we have one substituent, two substituents off. Those two chlorines are on the same face, the same side of that double bond. So if we're looking at this, they're on the top face. Okay. So we call that cis uh, dichloroethene. Okay. There's only two places for it to be, one and two, and the cis is saying, telling you they're on the same side, different carbons. And then they could be on opposite faces, right? In that case, we refer to it as a trans dichloroethene. So this concept of isomers, we also have isomers with the alkanes, Okay, alkanes, we can have compounds with the same molecular formula, but a different arrangement of atoms. So be on the lookout for the isomerism in the alkanes also. They're just different, all right? This one, they're geometric, the geometry, different faces. With the others, with the alkanes, it's simply um, a different arrangement of the carbon atoms. All right, cis trans isomers are different compounds. Keep that in mind. So different compounds means they're going to have different physical properties. Same thing happens with the alkanes, with isomers of alkanes. You're going to end up with two different compounds, different names, different physical properties. All right, well, how about chemical properties of the alkenes? Remember, alkenes, they really weren't super reactive. The only thing they really did was combust, all right? It turns out that our alkenes are more reactive than our alkanes. That's because of the double bond. And so not only do they combust, uh, all organic compounds uh, burn in the presence of oxygen to give you carbon dioxide and water, but Alkenes also have two additional reactions. They undergo the addition of hydrogen, which is known as a hydrogenation. Hydrogenation is an example of a reduction reaction. And the second reaction that they undergo that you need to be familiar with is the addition of water. That's known as hydration. We're going to look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. All right. All right, so the chemical properties, like we said, right, they're more reactive than the alkanes. Two reactions here in addition to the combustion, hydrogenation. Reminder, it's an example of a reduction reaction. In this reaction, we're going to see that a hydrogen atom adds to each carbon in that double bond. These reactions require you to have a a catalyst, a transition metal catalyst, and typical catalysts, platinum, palladium, or nickel. So in this particular reaction, we begin with ethene. Let's show what we said. We're going to add hydrogen, okay, 
and we said that we require a catalyst, one of these catalysts. So let's choose in this case, let's choose platinum. Again, it could be palladium or nickel, right? And we said that our hydrogen is going to add across that double bond to eat one to each carbon. So let's look real closely at what happens um, in the product, right? We've gone from a double bond to a carbon carbon single bond, right? And hydrogen to one carbon hydrogen bond and another carbon hydrogen bond to the other. So we've gone from ethene which is unsaturated to ethane, which is a saturated alkane. Okay. All right. So that was an example of the addition of hydrogen. Our second reaction is the hydration. In hydration, the elements of water, that means hydrogen and hydroxide, H and OH, add to each side of the double bond. In these reactions, you need an acid catalyst, such as sulfuric acid. You'll often see it written as just H plus over the arrow. So here we go. We start with ethene, which is an alkene, unsaturated. We're going to add our water. And we said we need to have an acid catalyst, sulfuric acid. OK, we'll add the whole thing here. Sometimes it's just H plus. And what did we say is going to happen? Hydrogen's going to add to one side, OH to the other. So we now have a carbon to hydrogen single bond, and on the other, a carbon to OH. All right, we have what's known as an alcohol. Again, we've gone from an unsaturated carbon carbon double bond to a saturated carbon carbon single bond. We formed a new bond, carbon to hydrogen, and carbon to OH. That is known as a hydration. So a hydration reaction gives you an alcohol as a product. All right, our alkynes. Alkynes, they have the general formula CnH2n-2. Again, from just that molecular formula, you can figure out what you have, whether you have an alkane, an alkene, or an alkyne, all right? And they have to have at least one carbon-carbon triple bond. Here's an example. One carbon-carbon triple bond, all right? And again, notice that every single carbon here has four bonds to it. This is one butyne. This is known as a terminal alkyne. And this one here, we would name it, okay, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We got to give the, uh, an, the lowest number to that uh, first carbon of the triple bond. So this is two butyne. This is an internal alkyne. Alkyne reactions, right? The presence of that triple bond makes them more reactive than alkanes also. They undergo many of the reactions that the alkenes do. They undergo hydrogenation, the addition of hydrogen. Okay. So we have our triple bond. Let's take our simplest alkyne that we could possibly have to show you what happens. Right. So we're going to just add one um, equivalent, one hydrogen, right, H2. So we're going to see the same thing happening here. We're going to add one hydrogen here, one hydrogen to the other side, and we end up with an alkene, right, ethene, all right, ethine. We go to ethene, all right, well, we could shake things up a little bit. We can start with that same alkyne, and rather than just one molecule here, right, one mole, let's add two, all right, so that means we're going to get addition once, right, so let's add one, one here, right, one there, you'll get a double bond, and then when we add our second one, we're going to go all the way to an alkane, right, so if we add two moles of your hydrogen, you're going to go from the alkyne to the alkane, 
one mole alkyne to the alkene. All right. And that's it. That's the uh, only reaction that you have to be able to work with for the alkynes. All right. So that completes our part one of our chapter 11 discussion. We'll be back with part two later.